go. There we are. We're live. Hello, friends. I've got my daughter Taylor here. She wanted to come on and say hi. Are you going to say hi? Yeah. What are you going to say? Hi. Hi. Go ahead. Hi. We're going to talk today about stress and the cost, like the effect of it on our bodies. What do you know about what stress does to your body? What do you know about that? We didn't plan this conversation. No practice. What do you know? Nothing. Does it feel uncomfortable? No. I don't know. You don't know. Yeah. Well, is there anything else you want to say? Yeah. Okay. Well, friends, this is the first time I'm coming to you live in um, the Calm Mother Connection. So Stephanie Dickerson here, and I'm here today to talk to you about the cost of stress, like the price that we pay in our bodies, and what we can do to cut that cost, what we can do to mitigate the negative effects of stress and talk about like what are the actual like are there positive effects like is it possible to um opt out of stress in these types of conditions and answer any other questions that you might be have having um especially if you want to chime in and share them with me if you're here with me or if you're watching the replay let me know how have these weeks of exponentially increasing stress, how have they been showing up in your body? And, and that would be helpful for me to be able to speak to exactly what is happening for you. Um, but one thing that we know for sure is that stress does have an effect on our body. And this is no longer something wooey wooey or something out there. In fact, in the mainstream medical literature, it is said that 75 to 90% of all doctor's visits are stress related. So 75 to 90% of all of the doctor's visits across the board are stress related. And that is coming from not alternative practitioners or not people who like um, just are into alternative medicine or like self-healing or inner work that are saying that. This is, this is like what it says on PubMed. This is the basic statistics that the mainstream medical um, system is operating under. So since that is true then we really understand two things from that and one is that stress has a negative effect on our health and two now more than ever it is really up to us to minimize the effects on our body right this is a time when we need to step up our sense of self-reliance and our ability to take care of ourselves and to not overburden um, the medical system that is going to be dealing with these really acute cases okay so does that make sense to you did you what did, do you think of that statistic is that like higher than you would have expected some um, healers and practitioners say that up to 99% of all illness is stress related. And some people would even go so far as to say nearly 100%, even like how we handle something unknown like the coronavirus. Um, but again, just the mainstream statistics, the evidence-based um, numbers that come out of mainstream medicine is that 75 to 90 percent of all doctors visits are stress related and when we talk about stress this is our body's like response to real or perceived threats and in 
this type of situation, it's a combination of the two, right? Here we have something that is a real threat to our well-being. And in each individual present moment, for most of us, it is not actually at our doorstep. It's not actually that our life is in danger. But because of the way that our physiology takes over, we respond as if it is so. And so we get this cascade of physiological response to stress that is, is our survival mechanism kicking in. This is the sympathetic division of our autonomic nervous system, which you can think of autonomic as automatic, um, meaning that it just happens without your needing to control it. The thing that is deceiving about that description of it, that autonomic nervous system is that it's automatic, is that it gives us the sense that it's not within our control. And it's true that we don't have to be in charge of our heart beating and pumping blood throughout our body. And we don't have to be in charge of our respiration and taking in oxygen and processing it. And we don't have to be in charge of our digestion. And yet, it is within our purview, it is within our capacity to affect our stress response. Does that make sense? So it's automatic in that we're not controlling it, but it's not that we don't have the power to positively affect us. And I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but that's the first thing that we really need to know and that we really need to own if we are wanting to cut the cost of stress on our physical body. To cut down the possibility that we are going to negatively affect our health to the extent that we're going to actually need need help, need medical attention in the short term or more likely in the long term. Okay, so that is that it is not, we are not powerless to affect our autonomic nervous system. We are not powerless to step out of our stress response. We actually have so much power to stop this cascade of our survival response which I'm just gonna circle back a little bit and talk to you. Um, a lot of times I spend time talking about our stress style and so that the different ways, the different pathways that we enact that stress response, being fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. But I'm gonna talk today instead of about our style and the way that we enact that, but actually what happens within us physiologically when we enter any one of those pathways. And the first thing that happens is that our, mm, here's how I say it, every system in our body constricts. So it tenses up and tightens up. Every system in our body constricts and tightens up, prepares for action except one, and that's our eyes, which actually dilate in order that we might scan around us for danger more effectively. So if you think about every system in your body tensing up, except for the one that is designed to scan for danger, and you get a good sense of what it feels like, but your blood pressure increases, your heart rate increases, your body temperature increases, you can get hot or sweaty, your stomach gets that feeling of a flip or a knot in it, all of your muscles tense up. There's also um, a response that happens in that fear response where our head comes forward and the small muscles at the base of our skull tighten up 
And it's been shown um, in a lot of these really cool studies that they did in Rolfing, that Ida Rolf did, how every time that we get into that fear response, we hunch forward a little bit and our head shifts forward, our head, which is so heavy. I, I can't remember, what does your head weigh? It's like 12 pounds or something crazy like that. And it shifts off the axis of our spine and all these teeny tiny muscles at the base of our skull, which are some of the strongest in our body, tense up and what happens is that without a real concerted effort we don't go back into ease and back into alignment and so our body tends responds by making those muscles stronger by laying down fibrous tissue. It's like our body goes into this emergency response and then when we don't come out of it, um, the reinforcements come in and are like, okay, we are now living here with our heads forward, hunched over a little bit. And so we're gonna make these straps that are holding up our head and that are keeping us tense and ready to go. We're gonna make those stronger. So this is what one of the symptoms that I'm speaking to is the knots and the tension that we get in our shoulders and up through the base of our head and our neck. As our body says, if you're going to use those muscles like a strap, we'll make them a stronger strap. And this tissue becomes more and more fibrous and we get less and less of blood flow um, and exchange of nutrients and wastes coming out of um, our tissues. Um, this happens not just in this area where we're used to holding or thinking of like kind of like chronic tension or stress, but it happens all throughout our body. As everything is constricted, then we get less and less exchange of nutrients and oxygen and less removal of wastes from our tissues. Another big part of what happens, um, so that's a little bit at the musculoskeletal level, but at the level of our digestion, um, what do you think our body thinks if we're in imminent danger? Like digestion is not of utmost importance. And so our body shifts from using our like longer term sources of fuel, like fat, and starts burning instead the shorter term um, faster responding um, stores of like glycogen, which actually comes out of our muscles. So it does kind of circle back to uh, another musculoskeletal response. But we start to use resources right out of our muscles for this short term, meant to be short term stress response. So our longer term um, digestion that is responsible for really doing a good job um, digesting our food and taking those nutrients and sending them to all the different places in our body, that slows down, that actually goes on lockdown. So in the stress response, our peristalsis or the movement of through food through our digestive tract, that slows down or ceases. And so food kind of like sits in our stomach and we don't get a good uptake of nutrients or an efficient removal of wastes coming through our body. And since much of our immune system is located in the cells that line our digestive tract and our stomach, we get, this is one of the reasons why we get a diminished immune response during um, a stress response. So the thing is, is that it's not a flaw that we were designed this way. It's not like, oops, this is actually really important for our survival that we have this capacity to respond when there is a real danger. What is meant to happen is that we get out of that danger. We get away from this stressor or this invader, um, or we fight off the infection. And we 
then get to move on and shift back into the parasympathetic division of our nervous system. So into the relaxation response, also known as rest and digest, or calm and connect. So where we can have more calm, where we can access connection, and where we have the types of thoughts and mindset that is supportive of that calm and connection. This is also the place where digestion, rest, repair, rejuvenation, where that happens. So when we don't have access or we don't shift back into this rest and digest and into calming connection, we end up like really functioning um, in a really limited way. We don't have very much access to resources and it's like if you think about um, our body's stores as like refilling our pantry, it's like our pantry never gets filled back up. We're always kind of operating at this deficit. So this is, I, I mean, this was always the case. This is always the case. Um, and now it's just really amplified. But that most people in our society, most people, most mothers, most, um, most people are not effectively shifting out of the real and perceived stressors, the response to the real and perceived stressors in their life on a regular basis to where they're spending enough time out of fight or flight and in rest and digest in order to effectively repair their bodies. And so this is the cause of that 75 to 90% of doctor's visits, right? Does that make sense? If you are like having a tiger chasing you and you run and you get this cascade of stress hormones and these symptoms, um, that all come along with it, but then you get into, you know, your cave, you get home and whew, you get to let go of that stress response and, you know, you feel safe again right away. You're not going to go to the doctor, you know, unless the, the tiger gets you, um, but you're not going to go to the doctor. That is, there is not a negative response to that type of stress. It's not detrimental to our health. What happens is that if we get home and um, we don't feel safe then, once we get home, because we're looking at our phones and now we've shifted into from a real stress and into a perceived stress. So into the stress that is not actually right here in this moment, but that is coming from what we're looking at, what we're focusing on, um, what we're afraid of happening in the future, or what we're regretting the choices that we've made in the past. And then we don't shift back into safety and we just go through the motions of wanting to do some things to do our best to take care of ourselves, but we're not actually shifting back into safety. And so these things that we do, the like acknowledging our feelings, um, hmm, talking about our problems, like venting, um, talking about our concerns or our worries with our partners, Mm, taking breaks, taking time for ourselves, um, doing things that, that feel good in the moment, but that aren't good for us in the long term. These things don't actually shift us back into safety as in into that division of our nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system where rest and digest happens, where our body has the capacity to repair um, and to rebuild its stores, 
like to replace the glycogen from the muscles that it burnt in that short-term stress response. Like right now, if you were to head out to the grocery store and you were to kind of be in the vigilance that is necessary right now. So like maybe you're wearing a mask, you're thinking about the things that you're touching and not touching. You've got your hand sanitizer, making sure you're a safe distance away from people. And that is going to be natural that your senses are heightened, that you enter kind of a place of vigilance. And it doesn't have to be hyper vigilance, but if you just think about this as like, then you're out there, there is a real like threat at that point, but then you come home, if you can come home and shift back into the safety of your nervous system. Or say you're a healthcare professional and you are on the front lines and you are in this real stress, this real like, real threat to your well-being and so it's right and good that you are having your like um your senses heightened your vigilance up so that you can respond adequately and really really keep your safe self safe but now you've spent 8 or 10 or 12 hours in the stress response it's going to be so important that you know how to shift your nervous system back into safety when you get home. Does that make sense? And it is possible. I know I've just been kind of like talking a lot here, so I want to get back to my three points, which is the first point is, the, is to know no matter what your circumstances, if you are a human being, you have the power to positively affect your autonomic nervous system and to shift into parasympathetic mode, to shift your nervous system back into safety. Even if you're spending eight to 10 hours, even if you're worried about um, bringing the virus home to your kids, no matter what, you have the ability to step back into safety because you choose to. Because you choose to step back into safety and to walk yourself into that division of your nervous system. It doesn't mean, I don't think, it's not putting our heads in the sand. It's not like walking ourselves into denial. It's saying, I'm going to choose to take care of myself by, by taking my physiological response and flipping the switch and coming into safety. So this is my biggest point is that it's really important for us to know that it is not outside of our power to do that. It is well within our power. The second thing that I really want to speak to in terms of just owning the cost of our stress response on our health and cutting the cost of it is, and this is so important to me, is that we don't make ourselves wrong for having this stress response or even for it being hard to walk ourselves out of it. We are not wrong for that. It is not easy to shift from a feeling of vigilance and from a feeling of perceiving threat all around you. It is not easy to walk from that and, and just say, okay, I'm going to be safe now, I'm safe now. We're not wrong for that and we can't, simultaneously berate ourselves for having the responses that we have in stress, for the hypervigilance or vigilance, for wanting to control things, for um, not being able to settle down into presence, for um, numbing out or not being able to engage, feeling like shut down or kind of blah 
um, or really, really heavy, right? Like a lot of people, the, the people who aren't reporting difficulty sleeping, most of them are reporting excessive sleeping. So, and neither of those are wrong. And we can't make ourselves wrong simultaneously for these things that are happening to us, for our, our tension, um, for our discomfort, for being impatient with our kids. We can't simultaneously do that and walk into safety. So while the first step is to acknowledge and own that we have the power to do that, the second step is that we have to love ourselves in our stress response in order to do that. Does that make sense? We can't simultaneously be hating our fear or hating our anger or our desire to control and come into safety. Hmm. So the third step then, if both of these things are true, is to find a new way of getting from fight or flight or freeze or fawn and into safety. Um, and when I say a new way, I mean like stepping into our new brain. So stepping out of the thinking of fight or flight, which is where that self-criticism, that judgment, that blame outside of ourselves or blame within ourselves, where that lives. So what I'm going to invite you to do now is these three steps that I'm going to share with you. And the first step, and you're welcome to close your eyes as if, if you're in a place where you can do that. But it's just to take a couple of deep breaths. And it might help to put your hands on your heart. And to just draw your awareness back into your body. So feeling the breath moving past the tip of your nose and into your chest. Feel your hands on you and your hand on top of your other hand. And just breathing until you can really feel your body. What happens to most of us is that we get stuck trying to get out of our stress response within it, like with the same strategies that we're using for survival. It's like we're sort of like clawing around trying to use those same strategies to get ourselves out of survival. And here what we're gonna try to do is just the opposite. And so we're gonna drop in from our mind and down into our bodies. So breathing, even if it takes you two or three minutes here to just Settle right into your body. And then I'm mean, gonna I give you three questions to pose to yourself. And the first one is, what can I be grateful for? What can I be grateful for right now? feeling such gratitude for my littlest daughter who I could hear. You could probably hear too. She's turning one tomorrow. Mm, she's bringing so much light and love into our lives right now. Her siblings love her so much. What can I be grateful for in this moment?
And then what am I doing right? What have I done right today? What have I done well today? I really, what have I done right today? I'm really feeling, mm, a, a situation with my kids that I didn't initially handle perfectly at all. Mm, but I responded really well afterwards really did that right. What can I be grateful for? And what have I done right? What did I do well today? Just breathing so that you stay feeling your body in your body. And then the third part. What do I want to, what am I excited about that's coming? What am I excited to see unfold? as we move into the future. I'm so excited for the unfolding of spring, for the feet of snow in our yard to melt and for the earth to reveal itself. I'm so excited to see how the world looks and unfolds as we come out of our cocoons on the other side of this. You might be excited to see schools reopen or your hospital to recover or to be hugging your friends again. What are you looking forward to? So breathing to come back into our body. And then these three questions. What can I be grateful for? What have I done right? What am I doing well today? And what am I looking forward to? What am I excited about? And then in this place, we have the opportunity to tune in and to really hear our guidance. So once we have shifted in and started to come into our connection with ourselves and with something larger than ourselves, then what we can hear is more aligned with who we want to be, with who we really are, with guidance, with what we feel is the highest power that we can draw upon. And so we can listen now for that small, quiet voice inside that says, Mm, this would be good for me. And it might be to journal. Or it might be to reach out. And I hope <laughs> it would be this for you to go ahead and book a call with me just to connect with someone to ask for some help. That would be good for me. It might be to
to do something different that you don't normally do. Take a bath if you normally take a shower. To go for a walk at a time when you don't normally go outside. To respond the opposite of how you would normally respond with your children. To do something different, to reach out for support when normally you tell yourself, I should figure this all out on my own. So I hope that that served you by giving you a taste of that shift in your own body and a sense of how you continue then to follow the thread of what you find there. Thanks for being here with me today and I am um, planning to be here on Sunday it's afternoon my time but Sunday afternoon or evening depending on where you are for um, this to be the regular time um, that I come on and talk to you self-care Sunday school I was going through an old notebook and and found that note from actually months ago so here we go settling on this day so I hope I see you um, before then but if not, next week. Bye for now.